We'll call the Senate Energy uh, and Utilities Policy and Finance Committee to order. It is uh, Tuesday, March 8th, uh, approximately 3.05 in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, three bills before us today. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, Senator Dames with Senate File 3508, dealing with the Granite Falls Hydroelectric Facility. So, Senator Dames, as you're uh, ready, uh, please proceed, introduce yourself, and uh, tell us your story. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Senator Gary Dames, and today I have in front of us Senate File Number 3508. I do not have any amendments, so I would like to present the bill. It's a pretty clean bill. It's a bill for $2,290,000 to be appropriated from the, uh, let's see, from the, got to see where it's coming from here, from the Renewable Development Account. And the reason that we're requesting this money is last year we put some money in for the hydro system. And as they got into this and got further into the ready to, to start on the construction and stuff, the deeper they got into the soil and stuff, the more they found the concrete was uh, in bad shape and a lot of other things. So I have with me today the city administrator from uh, Granite Falls, Crystal Johnson. So Crystal, if you'd be, if it's okay with you, Mr. Yep. Chair, I'd like to have Crystal go, Crystal go into the bill a little deeper as far as the needs and what's causing the, the reason for us being here. Uh, thank you, Senator Dames, and welcome, uh, Ms. Johnson. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Crystal Johnson. I am the city administrator for Granite Falls. And I firstly just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and thank you for your time. Um, and the reason that the, our Granite Falls is here today is we are asking for continued uh, support for phase two, utilizing RDA funding towards much needed critical infrastructure repairs to our hydro facility, uh, specifically 1.8 million towards infrastructure repairs. And as was just shared uh, during phase one, we discovered much needed more critical infrastructure um, that was not previously known. And in addition, 490,000 towards gap financing for turbine number three. Currently, the facility houses three turbines and we're in the process of utilizing RDA funding to replace turbine number three. <laughs> And unfortunately, um, after bidding twice, it was a cost came back higher due to impacts with COVID-19, unfortunately higher labor costs, material costs, um, that we are struggling to, to finance that difference. Um, for a city of less than 3,000 people, a little over 2.2 million is, is very difficult for us. And we are asking for your ongoing support in assisting us with RDA funding to complete this project. And with completing this project, it will double the city's hydroelectric uh, capacity, as well as the further the increased output will result in cost savings to help our community with the revenue loss as a result of the decommissioning of the former NSP or XL generating, electric generating plant. Uh, that closure has had a, a significant impact on our tax base, and this is one project that is helping us uh, with energy savings that we can use to help offset some of that impact. Um, also, this project will continue to help ensure a form of renewable, carbon-free, pollution-free, and fuel-free energy for many future years to come. I also want to extend an invitation to anyone who um, is interested to please come out and, and view our facility. I'm happy to give a tour and, and show exactly what we're doing and, and some of the repairs that are needed as a part of this funding request. And with that said, I certainly want to leave an opportunity for questions or discussion, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Ms. Johnson, thank you very much. Uh, just, uh, just so that I'm, I'm clear on this, uh, so this is, uh, this is a, a, a repair. I'm looking. I'm, I'm reading about a third turbine, but did, are we buying a third turbine with this, or is it just repair of the existing? It's a facility? replacement. So currently, the facility does house three. However, uh, turbine number three is in the process of being replaced, utilizing um, RDA funding, and going through that bid process is uh, when we you know, discovered, unfortunately, COVID um, had some impacts 
and resulted in a higher cost. Uh, so, Ms. Johnson, so the 2.29 million or so. One, for I apologize does not, for clarifying. Not buy another. Turbine. For for you, clarification, 1.8 million for additional infrastructure of repairs to the facility itself. So during phase one, we discovered uh, erosion with the slot gates, uh, concrete repairs to the facility, and other improvements, um, some of them being safety-related improvements that are much needed with the facility. 490000 would be for that gap financing towards the turbine number three, or equaling in total the 2290000 So 490000 for... To, uh, to to use an addition of money you already have for a new turbine? Correct. Okay. Okay. And just one last. Are you in the RD or the XL territory? I don't, I, or is this your own utility? This is your own building, right? Correct. It, it, we are our own municipal oh, yeah. electric okay. utility. Yep. Okay. Anybody else questions? Senator Eric? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. Um, when did you have to decommission um, the one turbine, and how long do you anticipate it being out for the the lost revenue. Ms. Johnson? So the turbine number three has been um, not functional since 2016. Um, so at this point, what we are wanting to do is to replace it, which will help with energy savings as a result, in part as a strategy of the decommissioning of the current asset NSP plant. Senator Reich, any? Senator Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair, yes, can I so make Senator a Dave. comment? Uh, Senator Rick, just so I'm clear here, the loss of income is going to come from the fact that the XL energy plant in Granite Falls has been decommissioned. And so now that's going to come off the tax rolls, and so their net tax capacity is going to drop by about 31%. And in a town of 3,000 population, that is a big hit to lose 31% of your tax capacity. Thank you. Yep. If Thank I may. you, Senator Dames. Uh, Senator Rutke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Ms. Johnson, just a, a question um, or curiosity. It, when the three turbines are all up and running, how much electrical service, or what do you generate? How much? Johnson? Sure. Um, right now with one and two, it's 0.8 megawatts, but uh, the size of with turbine number three will double that capacity, uh, bringing that total capacity to around 1.5 megawatts. So, Ms. Johnson, so I heard you. So, uh, with with three turbines running, it'd be about a megawatt and a half or so. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? Questions? Is there any other testimony? No, That's that fine. would be be the testifiers. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I think we'll just move uh, Senate File uh, 3005, 3500. 3508. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's under my computer. Uh, Senate File 3508 uh, will set it aside for possible inclusion in the, uh, in, the, in the omnibus bill. Thank you so much, uh, Senator James and Ms. Johnson. I have to ask, uh, uh, how long have you, uh, you replaced uh, Dave, right? Uh, um, Bill Lavin. All right. I'm sorry. I got, got the wrong, wrong person. All right. Very good. Well, welcome. How long have you been in this position? I've been with the city now close to five years. Oh, really? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> time, time flies. <laughs> <laughs> well, five years goes by quickly. All right. Thanks so much for being here today and driving uh, on it. We really do appreciate you being, you know, being thank here you. in person. That really has helped. Well, thank you, members yeah. and Mr. Chair. Thank we do appreciate you hearing the bill. Thank good. you. We hey, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Moving on. We have... Uh, Senate file 2947, a uh, resolution uh, disputes between public utilities and residential customers procedures uh, establishment. Uh, and Senator Friends. Good morning, Welcome Mr. Chair, members. <laughs> I think I'm going to be joined by uh, Mr. Sullivan and then I, I think Mr. Elwood's online. Does that sound right? Yeah, it sounds just fine. All set? All set. Proceed when you're ready. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm very proud to present Senate File 2947, which is the result of a significant amount of collaboration on the question of residential access to the Public Utilities Commission. 
So here's the short version. Right now, Minnesota is the only state in the country where residents don't have direct access to the Public Utility Regulating Commission. What this bill does is allows for that access when the administrative remedy already provided by the Public Utilities Commission staff uh, leaves them with a desire to appeal. So imagine any of your constituents who have a residential matter they want addressed, they take it to the PUC, the result of that PUC administrative determination is unfavorable to them everywhere else in the country. They would have a right to go to the commission. Here in Minnesota, they do not. Senate file 2947 would give those residential customers, all of our constituents, that right. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I was hoping we could have some testimony from Public Utilities Commissioner and proud uh, Mankato, Minnesota resident. Senator Minnesota. Franz, would you like to? I have an A of one sorry. amendment. Uh, you know that, what? Uh, it says right here, move the amendment. <laughs> that, uh, we could proceed you know what I'd love to ready. do to get the bill in the shape I want it in, Mr. <laughs> Chair, uh, instead of just listening to myself talk all afternoon, is to offer the uh, A1 amendment. Okay. Senator Franz has offered the A1 amendment. Uh, get the bill in, uh, in the shape that he'd like it, uh, and perhaps which he's already described it to some extent. Uh, any, uh, any questions on that? It's okay. All in favor then say aye. Aye. The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator French, you have a new bill. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Now that the bill is in the shape, which I think it should be, um, I thought we would take some testimony from Public Utilities Commissioner and proud Mankato resident, Joe Sullivan. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Sullivan, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, you here. <laughs> thank you, Senator Sendrum, and thank you, Senator Friends. I always feel like I'm along for the ride. Um, <laughs> so thanks, Senator Friends. Um, I appreciate the introduction. And I, my name is Joe Sullivan. I'm a commissioner on the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission. It's nice to be here with you all today. Um, I have um, some prepared remarks, um, but I can really uh, shorten them up, uh, you know, to First of all, state that um, you know the commission is not. We have not taken a formal vote on on the legislation, so I can't say that the commission is is uh, in support or against this legislation. What I can say, though, is that uh, the Ch chair Seben and myself are supportive of the direction uh, that um, uh, Mr. Elwood and Legal Aid and Senator Frentz are um, going with this legislation. We think it's an important avenue uh, for individuals. Uh, to uh, be able to seek redress. You know, right now, the way that um, our under current law, a formal complaint uh, may be initiated by a local subdivision of the state, uh, another public utility by the Department of Commerce, or by any, you know, by 50 consumers. So that creates, um, for somebody, an individual who um, comes to the commission and uh, they cannot seek a um, formal redress of their complaint um, if it's not settled by our informal resolution system. So what the legislation does is it creates a specific pathway uh, for a complainant to get a decision from the commission about their specific complaint. And then it allows them to have judicial review. So it's, it's really, in my view, a, a good government approach to allow people uh, to be able to, to ensure that that we have a fair process that's there and that um, multiple uh, eyes can look at the legislation or look at their complaint and their issue uh, and that they can, you know, seek redress. And I think that's a very, um, you know, very fair and um, that's uh, just, it's a good due process for the way that um, um, people who are coming to the commission. I think that right now uh, the, the Minnesota commission has a, um, uh, a consumer affairs office. Uh, it's an informal resolution uh, uh, office. What they do is uh, they, we have a, four staff who resolve um, concerns and problems that are brought to the commission. Uh, their information is on our website and, and I, I, um, everybody can go and, and, and look at uh, you know, the, the CAO's webpage uh, to see what they offer, but it's an informal resolution. Uh, we resolve about 2,000 complaints per year, uh, and we think that this legislation um, really adds an additional tool uh, to the CAO to assist in, in helping Minnesotans um, address problems that they may have with uh, their utility. So with that, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present and to be here today. Thank you, uh, Senator Friends, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, 
I, I have just one question just to make sure what I'm reading here. So this just pertains to a, a, a residential uh, situation, uh, not a commercial. Is that correct? It look, appears to be. Mr. Chair, is that yes. for me or Commissioner Sullivan? It, In line 123, it seems to indicate uh, a residential customer exclusively as opposed to any. Mr. Chair, we are expanding if the passage of the bill does occur. So residential ratepayers now will have the same access that is afforded to other entities currently. So yes. Oh, OK. okay. <clears throat> uh, and uh, Senator Friends or your, your witness, uh, it, are, are the complaints just related to billing? Or could there be any complaint that would, any issue would come before the Public Utilities Commission? Um, the, the issues that would, uh, Senator Senjum, uh, members of the committee, it relates to the service provided to the individual. So it could be a billing question. It could be an issue of, um, you know, they have, um, you know, they're having quality of service problems. So it could be an issue that then is brought as, uh, to, the, to the commission for resolution, but it relates to their service from the utility mm -hmm. company. So it's not just a billing issue, but it could be more than, you know, it could be, you know, like they're having, you know, uh, issues with, uh, you know, low voltage or, I mean, I'm just, I'm just spitballing here. Uh, I think Mr. Elwood could speak more to, you know, what he um, is thinking, but it, it's not just related to billing issues. It, it, it's related to service and all that encompasses that service at that meter. Senator Frantz, would you like to have Mr. Elwood? I would, Mr. Chair, and I'd also we'll like to add. Into questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, sure. members. I'd also like to add that of the complaints that are saying they're most desiring the ability to go to PUC, they are more service than billing. Mm -hmm. um, things that uh, utilities are doing with our constituents, where the, the ratepayer would like an opportunity to go directly to the commission, and that's what's lacking under the current system: a more service than the billing. Okay. And with that, um, I certainly invite the chair to consider having Mr. Elwood testify. Well, Senator Matthews, why don't you ask your question and then we'll go to Mr. Elwood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just really quickly, uh, probably Commissioner Sullivan uh, takes these ones. Do you anticipate this taking uh, extra time or staff at the commission that you'll already have? Will there be a fiscal note uh, needed for this bill? Is there one already? I'd like to know, thanks. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, Senator Senjum uh, and Senator Matthews, uh, we do anticipate that uh, this will, there, there will be additional work at the commission. Um, the, um, and there will be a fiscal note uh, that is being prepared right now. I, I can't speak to the specifics of what that fiscal note will be, but we do anticipate that there will be um, some additional uh, work that needs to uh, get that needs to be accomplished, uh, there would be, that would be related, you know, reflected in an, an, an FTE, and then there could be also some technology and software uh, support that needs to come along with that, and that's being fleshed out right now. Sir Matthews, follow-up? Oh. Quick follow-up, just to confirm, then yes, you expect you'll be hiring at least one or more additional staff uh, if this bill passes. Mr. Sullivan? Uh, Senator Sengem, Senator Matthews, that is correct. We think that there would be an impact. I'm sorry if I wasn't, okay. wasn't more clear. Okay, anybody else? Senator Utke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, did you say currently, I mean, I'm reading some of the new stuff, but currently it takes 50 people or somebody to agree to a, a common problem to be able to file? Is that correct? Mr. Chair? Yes, uh, Senator, uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Utke. That is one of the ways that residential customers can get access to the full commission now is to have 50 collectively who have the same complaint or want to go to the commission. What the bill does is say that residential uh, ratepayers would not need to get to 50, that they could bring their complaint to first to the administrative staff of the PUC, and then that's where every other state has an appeal. So a constituent of yours in Senate District 2 has a 
question of their utility. They raise the fuss. They go to the administrative side. They're told, sorry, nothing we can do right now that constituent Senate District 2 has no further redress. They can't go to court. They can't go to the full PUC unless there are 49 others or more that are in that category. What the bill does is say that that constituent, in my example, would have the access directly to the PUC. Okay, Senator Rutke. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Frentz. But that's kind of my concern. I'm wondering what we're trying to solve completely, because I'm just afraid that uh, Senator Matthews brought it up, because that was going to be my thing, too. The amount of traffic you may get, and we see that in a lot of things, where they'll nickel and dime your time to death um, with and you know the, the need for additional staff and the research time and such. So I'm really wondering what we're going to accomplish by letting every little thing come to you that's already gone through steps to be solved. And you know, some people you just can't satisfy. And so that's kind of what I'm asking. How are we going to do that? Uh, Senator Frantz, I don't want to. Uh, oh, thanks, Mr. You, Chair. You can answer that or not. <laughs> I will. I will. Uh, I appreciate that, Mr. Chair and Member. Senator Rutke, first of all, I know you're not suggesting that a constituent in Senate District 2 would be hard to satisfy, but to your question, yes, we are expanding the number of people. Keep in mind, this is only for the category of residential customers who have already gone through the process, already heard from the administrative staff, and want what they have in every other state, which is a chance to say, hey, we don't like it. So the theory is this benefits the residential rate payers only when they haven't heard enough from the administrative staff, and hopefully that's a limited number. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Rutke, if I could turn it over to the commissioner for any further comment, maybe that would help. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Um, Senator Senjum, uh, Senator Rutke, I, I think that in my read of the legislation, I've, I've reviewed the legislation, it is um, it's pretty kind of tightly dialed into service issues. Um, I do expect that there would be additional work, and I, I know that Mr. Elwood um, could speak to this, and that's why, you know, you know, the Consumer Affairs Office that we have at the Commission, you know, we serve about 2,000, we do about 2,000 complaints per year. We've got four staff. I mean, they're their, their time is completely full at this point. So we do anticipate that there would be some additional work that would come through. I, I think, though, that the language as it's constructed that Mr. Elwood um, has and Senator Friends and, and Mr. Elwood have um, put before the, the committee is, is pretty tightly dialed into the you know, group of folks who really have not been able to get redress um, through the informal mechanism that we have today. Uh, and, and this is another avenue for them. I can't speculate like how many additional staff that's part of the, the challenge here, or I can't tell you how many additional hours are gonna be worked or how many additional people, but I, I think that the language that Senator Friends has is, is pretty tightly dialed in to a, a group of folks who right now, are, quite frankly, are falling through the cracks. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Senator Rocky? Uh, it, and yeah, it did. And I just had one more, it, it, I guess it's maybe even a comment or question, but this is dialed into those that have specific service complaints. It isn't going to let it open up to they just don't like uh, maybe a new line that's coming by or any of those things. It's got to be, it's it's tightened up to where it's it's got to be service. So it's legit then, right? Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thanks, Member. Senator Rucky, that's correct. Although you didn't specifically mention a billing dispute also would be still allowed. It is now allowed if you have 50. So a okay. um, residential customer who says, hey, my bill is the wrong number would have this right as well as service. But the, prim the uh, primary group that we're looking at is those that have service complaints. I got disconnected. It doesn't work. Something like that where they didn't get the answer they wanted from the administrative staff. Why don't we hear from you. Uh, Mr. Elwood uh, uh, if, before we get too far further, because sure. I, I suspect he's got some has some good testimony for us. Uh, Mr. Elwood, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, there you Thank are. Thank you very right. much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. I, I really, first though, before I, I want to allay those concerns that you've raised. Number one, because I I really think this is. Uh, not going to create any problems um, from a resource standpoint. 
But I first want to thank Senator Frentz and Senator Rarick for uh, co-authoring the bill and bringing this forward. Um, the, the amendment before you, first of all, I want you to know, rep represents a significant effort um, and help from technical assistance offered by the PUC staff to make sure that this uh, bill and the process that's being set up will run smoothly with the existing commission procedures. And just as a, an aside, it clarifies uh, language from our friends at the Minnesota Rural Electric Association that this only applies to public utilities. Um, I also want to point out there's no opposition to this bill. It has been vetted with all the regulated utilities, as well as other stakeholders. You have a letter, I believe, in your packets from uh, Citizens Utility Board in support, and there are others in support. The reason that I really think that, that some of the concerns legitimate, because the first thing I thought about when we came to bring this forward to Senator Friends was, we don't want to open up any kind of floodgates and create a big um, open-ended kind of thing. And I, I would draw your attention to a couple of things in the bill that really make it extremely narrow. First of all, a complaint is defined as only something around terms and conditions of service and bill. And not only that, but in order to actually move forward to the commission level after a lower staff determination, you have to claim that it violates a statute, it violates a rule, it is, uh, violates a tariff. And the other thing that I think is, is cut off is the kinds of things of um, solar garden kind of things, programs, that is not, that would not be applicable here. It would not be applicable to anybody complain about their rates. And you'd have to, in a billing complaint, if you thought that, you know, my bill is too high, um, but if there was no, if you can't allege a violation of a law or a rule or some sort of um, violation of a, of a, a practice, a, a, a utility practice and policy of the commission, you can't get beyond where you are. So this is really aimed at people whose service is in jeopardy of being disconnected or they will be denied service. Here's a perfect example. Um, we've had these cases over time. I've been here for 25 years at Legal Aid working on these issues. I think uh, my colleague who works on this um, at, at Legal Aid actually handles the cases. Um, we probably would have sought appeal to the commission perhaps a dozen times over the last 20 years. But these issues are super important because they raise very critical issues that probably, in almost every case, don't just affect that one particular rate payer, but would affect many rate payers in the utility service territory, and perhaps every rate payer in every residential rate payer in the state. And these are issues that ought to be before the commission. They are before the commission in every single state in America, except here. So it's really narrowly tailored to, first of all, only things that are raising matters of law, rule, violations. Um, it doesn't replace any commission procedures. In fact, it codifies existing procedures requiring the, the, resi the residential consumer to first go to the utility. You, you can't pass, bypass go. You have to go to the utility first, and if you're dissatisfied, you have to go to the CAO. And let me say that the utilities and the CAO do a very, very good job in resolving most of the complaints. But when there's a rise, where there's a dispute about whether somebody violated a tariff or a law or, or a rule, and somebody's going to get their service disconnected or not going to get hooked up, then this is an issue that ought to be in front of the commission. Um, so I'll stop there and be happy to answer uh, any questions and really appreciate your time and consideration for this bill today. Any questions of uh, Mr. Elwood or, or any of the witnesses? 
can somebody just give me a little comfort to, I, I'm just talking, you know, it, it, this is about complaints. So anybody can have a complaint. The complaint can be uh, either very legitimate or, or depends on the eyes of the beholder, but uh, frivolous. Uh, could frivolous complaints in mass come forward and tie up the Public Utilities Commission? Uh, maybe yes or no to that one. And is there any, I don't see anything in here about timeliness. Uh, does the commission have to take up these consumer complaints with any degree of timeliness or, you know, what I'm talking about is a case that's out there that's rather controversial and, and okay, we can tie up the, the Public Utilities Commission by filing 500 cases, complaints. They may or may not be legitimate, but we know because of this statute that they have to take them up and uh, occupy their time on them as opposed to something else that... Uh, that may be of a, of a different public interest that's before the commission. Sure. Mr. Chair, yes. I, I propose to answer the first part mm -hmm. and defer to Mr. Elward on the second part. Um, to the question of frivolous claims, I think what Mr. Elward is trying to tell the members of the committee is to take it to the PUC, you have to allege a specific violation of statutes. So you can't just say my bill's too high or I don't like my utility company or my dog ate my homework. Um, and that acts as something of a filter the way I envision it. And as a civil litigator, we have some of those filters operating in Minnesota law, including medical malpractice and others, that do very effectively prevent frivolous claims. And it's my assertion to the committee here that this bill would limit frivolous claims in the same way. As to the timing, I'll uh, have Mr. Elwood jump back on. I assume he's still out there. I am, and I, I thank you. The, the answer to that question is no, for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, I, I draw your attention to lines 2.29 through 2.32 of the bill. First of all, the commission currently, under statute uh, 216A, has the ability to simply appoint uh, a couple of commissioners, even one commissioner, to, to do a kind of a preliminary review and decide whether or not uh, a matter should move forward to the full commission. This can happen here. That complaint could be disposed of very, very quickly. On line 2.32, the, uh, the bill allows the commission the authority they have now to simply dismiss the case because there's no reasonable basis on which to proceed. So, so to the extent that there, there is no merit um, to the case in the first place, then, which would be rare. In our, in our situation, um, every, all dozen cases we brought over the last you know, 15 years or so um, had some kind of a basis, uh, a meritorious basis. So um, the commission's existing authority to simply dispose of the uh, complaint, if it didn't feel there was any grounds, would, would be an expeditious and uh, essentially summary disposal um, of the matter. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, also the you know the legislature give it, and the legislature can take it away. So, uh, if uh, unforeseen circumstances do arise, why well, there's always another legislative session next year. Uh, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So let me follow up from before. And uh, Senator Frentz, if you uh, grew up on a farm like I did, you also get to say my goat ate my homework too. That's, uh, that's one that farm boys have used. Um, but back to Commissioner Sullivan and, uh, and costs. So are you planning to hire extra staff for a dozen cases over 20 years? Or I all know that uh, Ron Elwood is one of a kind. Are there a hundred Ron Elwoods out there that are also gonna utilize this in a similar fashion? Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Senator Sengem and Senator Matthews. Um, we are, I, I, just to be blunt, we're, we are trying to determine uh, in a very reasonable way what this would increase the workflow by. And that is, you know, part of the drafting of the, the fiscal note. I, I do know that it is likely we're going to have to hire at, probably, I mean, at least one new FTE because there will be additional work. And I, I recognize that, you know, 
they, um, there is, um, um, it is, I don't know how much extra work, but there will be additional work. And we have a staff in the CAO right now uh, that is, you know, like I said, they're processing about 2,000 um, complaints informally per year. We've got four folks in that office, and, and you know, their time is there completely at capacity. So there will be additional work that is, is covered. But as we're um, constructing a fiscal note right now, I mean, that's what we're, we're thinking about is, is exactly how many folks will this require? And, and, and then also what additional um, technology or IT needs might we need? So, okay. Mr. Mr. Chair, Chair. Uh, my understanding is we're laying this over today. Yeah. Right, yes. Okay, um, so with that, uh, this will we'll obviously need these questions answered before we make final decisions on this bill, but uh, appreciate the explanation of the bill here today. Sure, thank you. Uh, Senator uh, Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, the bill seems to be pretty descriptive, but at the end we talk about rulemaking. Can you help me understand uh, what rulemaking would have to be uh, done around this bill? Uh, Mr. Chair, to the, to the I author, think to the witness. <laughs> I think I'll have the witness. Um, Senator Sendrum, uh, uh, Senator Sendrum, Senator Rarick, um, I. Um, I need, I need to uh, get back to you to answer that question. So uh, I know that our legal counsel has looked at this, uh, and um, um, also Mr. Elwood has looked at this. But I can I can get an answer from you, uh, and I come back and, and answer it, you know, expeditiously for you. So, but I don't have an exact answer right now, and I don't want to hazard to guess. Mr. Sullivan, could you so we. Can Distribute that to the entire committee. Yep, we'll send it to the okay. entire committee. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. That that's something. It, it seems uh, we've dis described the process here. I, I guess I'm struggling to understand what the rulemaking might be. So I'll appreciate uh, seeing that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Elwood. I, I just want to uh, point out that the rulemaking uh, part of that is permissive, not mandatory. I see, yeah. So it, it was actually put in there just in case the commission thought they needed some rules. Um, frankly, if you wanted to take it out, I don't think it would be any big deal. Um, I, it was it was sort of a, a, to help folks if they were um, net, it was necessary they thought to make rules. But it's again, it's not requiring anything. So uh, and the other thing I'd like to just to point out is. Um, in terms of the concern about the workload, um, you know, I really appreciate Commissioner Sullivan's uh, support for the, the thrust here and, and giving consumers a voice in front of the commission, which they don't have now, if necessary, on these really critical cases. But I just want to emphasize the fact that in every single other state in America, this process, and sometimes even more, um, without, without as many guardrails as there are in this one, exists every place in America. And it has not created any concerns about resource drains, frivolous complaints, flooding of complaints, none of the things that you legitimately are concerned about and should be. Because that was, again, my first thought when I uh, came to send her friends with this, I said, well, we have to make sure that this doesn't overwhelm anybody. But I can't, I, if it hasn't happened in 49 states in the District of Columbia, some states much bigger than ours, I can't imagine that it would happen here in Minnesota. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Senator Rotke. Oh, Rarick, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, Senator Frentz, as we've been chatting here, one of the other things we discussed with the rulemaking would send this bill to state government. So would you be acceptable that we take the rulemaking portion out and to do an amendment to strike lines 3.19 and 3.20 and just leave the bill here in our jurisdiction? Uh, Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rourke. I'm a proud to report I have already marked it for removal, and I think that's probably the right way to handle it. 
I believe uh, what the testimony is, is that was put in there in case it was necessary, and not just for the state gov committee part of it, just for common sense. We don't have a need for rulemaking. Let's take it out. I think that's probably the smarter path, and with that, if that uh, is appropriate to make an oral uh, amendment, sure. Mr. Chair, I would do so, and by that, I'll just put it away. I'm uh, proposing that we remove lines 3.26 and 3.27. Uh, 3.19 and 3.2. Yeah, I, uh, how about if our uh, skillful it's, consul yeah, it's, it's, it tells you uh, what the motion Mr. Chair, be. members, uh, <laughs> the motion would be to delete, um, on page 3, line 19, delete subdivision 6, and that's on the A1 amendment. Yeah, that's my motion, How does that Mr. sound? Chair. It sounds just right. Very <laughs> specific, accurate. Okay. What we should do. So uh, a motion then to uh, delete... Uh, uh, subdivision uh, six, line three, well, whatever the motion was, subdivision six. Yes, Commissioner? Senator Sanjum, and then to the question that you had earlier about uh, uh, rainmaking, I confirmed it is a uh, kind of a belt and suspenders approach, so the commission is fine with it being removed. Let's, let's just act on the amendment. Uh, any discussion on the amendment? Sensing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And the uh, subdivision is removed. Uh, further questions on the bill? I have uh, my hand up, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. I have had my hand up. Yes. I Senator to Torsery. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask um, Mr. Elwood if he could share um, some, of the, some of the concerns. Um, I think it's important to make it to really understand the reason for why consumers need to have this. Um, what, what I have experienced and what I have been told you know, over the years is that the commission is not accessible to people. Even the building, you have to go to downtown, you have to pay for parking. There's an issue of access to the consumer that is a very complicated issue. And, and we, I would like to, you know, I think we need to have more sensibility about what that means for people. How do you access this commission? How do you, how do you put a complaint? How do you get information? It's, it's a pretty important issue. I think what I didn't hear from, from uh, Mr. Elwood is if he could illustrate to us some of the significant problems that people complain about. And, and then there is no vehicle. There is no way to to really get to that, that those are the I presume, Mr. Elwood, those are the people that actually come to to your organization asking for help because they have no way to access some of these agencies. Uh, many times they just face a, a recording machine, especially right now, where you just don't even get a person. Um, so I don't know if you can illustrate uh, today at least a case for why we as representatives of these uh, you know, consumers really need to have these type of services and offices and people more available so people can place complaints and, and document those because that's the other thing. We don't even document. I don't, I don't know, Commissioner, if we actually have information about the complaints that you receive and how you resolve them. I don't know if there's a report that show us the kind of complaints that consumers uh, bring to your attention and then what happened to them. What, what do we know as legislators about what happened to this information? Uh, Mr. Elwood, do you want to, uh, would you respond for us? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd be delighted. Thank you so much. Thanks for the question, uh, Senator Torres Ray. Torres -Ray. Um, yeah, I can give you certainly examples. Um, first of all, I just want to say that the utilities really do a good job in, in resolving most of the complaints. But sometimes they just don't know, they don't have some of the information. And also the staff of the PUC does a very good job in, in getting, you know, working with consumers to resolve complaints. However, sometimes there are issues of law that they're not necessarily familiar with. For example, if you live in an apartment building and you have a single meter, section chapter 504B, section uh, 504B.215 says that the landlord has to be the account holder of record. We have 
more than one case where all of a sudden a tenant will see their name, wind up having their name being on the account, and they are being billed by a utility for a significant amount of money because it's the landlord's bill. And there's a lot of confusion. And we've wound up in a situation where we have said, this is a violation of law, but unfortunately, we were not um, upheld. And there's no place to go. You are in a legal cul-de-sac once you leave the first round of, of dispute resolution, you can't go anywhere else to complain. That's an issue that the, that the commission ought to be working on. Another example is a good example. Um, you've signed up for service, and you get hooked up, and then all of a sudden you get a bill for $1,000. Because the utility will claim that, oh, you, you, you had a previous address at such and such street, and they didn't pay the bill, and therefore you're responsible. And there's a dispute about whether that's true or not. And the question is, that ought to be, that person is in jeopardy of losing gas and electricity, or electricity. And if that's the case, before that happens, that ought to go up to the commission for a full hearing. And so those are two good cases, I think, uh, of that we've had, um, where we've had some trouble getting past the, the, the gap in the law, which is what we're trying to fill right here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was yes. very helpful. I thought that examples, you know, illustrating the, the problems uh, can help us understand the need for this. Uh, thank, thank you, you Senator. Thank you for bringing this. Thank you, uh, Mr. Elwood. Uh, any further questions or comments? Uh, anyone else in the audience wish to testify on this bill? Okay. Sensing none, then, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Frentz and uh, Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Elwood. Uh, Senate file uh, 2947 as amended is uh, set aside for possible inclusion in uh, the omnibus uh, energy bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and stay seated. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, the Nick Frentz Day in the Energy Committee, I guess. So, uh, so with that, uh, moving forward, uh, we have 60, uh, Senate File 1621. Uh, again, the intervener compensation bill, and uh, we uh, have uh, Senator Frentz again before us. Uh, Welcome again, and uh, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. It's nice to be back before the Energy and Utility Committee. It's been a long time <laughs> since I presented a bill. I'm here to present for you Senate File 1621, uh, which was heard in part last year in this committee. And I want to note a few things before we begin the testimony. First of all, what we're trying to do here is provide for interventions that save ratepayers money. So that this is an intervener compensation bill, which with some specificity, describes the, the type and amount of compensation for an intervener and an entity. And principally what we're trying to do is try to provide support for interventions for those Minnesota ratepayers who do not otherwise have a voice. A couple things for the committee members before we take testimony. First of all, since this bill was last heard, Mr. Chair, it's undergone some significant revision, all of it in an attempt to respond to the concern raised by members of this committee. The criteria for compensation is quite limited. And uh, before I get into the specifics of the bill, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the A5 amendment. Uh, very good point. Uh, Senator Frentz is uh, moving the A5 amendment to bring uh, the bill into the order he wishes it. Uh, any discussion on the A5? Sensing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, and the amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I know there's some familiarity with the bill and with the issue, but just wanted to call your attention to subdivision three in which it describes the conditions. So if I was um, in your shoes, I'd be saying, okay, what are the conditions when this intervener compensation is awarded? And I hope members of this committee find that this is a reasonable set of boundaries to put on this. 
and I'm, I'm going to list them for you in part here. In order for the commission to order a public utility to pay this compensation, that intervener must demonstrate that the participant, that's the intervener, has materially assisted the PUC. If the participant's a nonprofit that is otherwise eligible for compensation, that that participant would suffer financial hardship if its participation in the proceeding was not compensated. Just noting for members of this committee that a year ago, one of the concerns was, what about this uh, large intervener from out of state who has tons of money and is just making trouble for us in Minnesota? Glad to report if you look at that subdivision, the intervener has to demonstrate financial hardship if they're not compensated. I hope members of the committee consider that that is an appropriate way to address that concern. In determining whether a participant has materially assisted the commissioner's deliberation, and this is very important, the Public Utilities Commission must find that the participant made a unique contribution to the record and that that interest would otherwise not have been adequately represented. Just consider um, a judge telling lawyers, hey, I'm not going to see your fees awarded unless you made a difference in a way that wouldn't otherwise have been made. That the participant's position promoted a public purpose or policy. So for this intervener compensation, Mr. Chair and members, that intervener has to say, look, this is a good thing for Minnesota ratepayers, and here's why. Think rate relief. Uh, think service protection. Some type of reason the intervener has to say, look, this is for a public policy and a good one. The evidence presented, arguments made, taken by the participant would not otherwise have been a part of the record. So the PUC has to find, we couldn't get this in the record some other way. This was not going to happen without this type of intervention. There weren't three other parties ready to provide this at no cost to the utility. This one made a contribution that would not otherwise have been found. That the participant was active in any stakeholder process included in the proceeding. Can't just jump in and intervene unless you've been a part of the discussions like many of our stakeholders here on the Energy Committee. And then the final criteria, members, I hope this uh, matters to all of us. The proceeding resulted in a commission order that adopted in whole or in part the intervener's argument. In other words, you do all these other things. You come in, you intervene, you actively advocate. But the commission does not adopt, in whole or in part, what you say is in the public's interest. Then there would be no compensation. You have to win on at least part of your argument to be eligible for intervener compensation in this part. And in determining whether a nonprofit participant has demonstrated that a lack of compensation would create financial hardship, we've included um, some basic criteria in uh, lines 223 to 229 that basically mean it's got to be uh, a smaller organization, again, watching for larger out-of-state entities that would come in. The reason we're asking for the committee to consider this is so we can have interventions, and as you know, some of the interventions are successful in saving ratepayers tens of millions of dollars. I have two testifiers here, um, and I'd like to ask um, Mr. Chair if we could have Annie Levinson Falk uh, address the committee. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Friends, and uh, yes, uh, please proceed, uh, Ms. Falk. Thank you, Chair Sundrum, and good afternoon, members. My name is Annie Levinson Falk, and I'm the Executive Director of the Citizens Utility Board, or CUB, which is a nonprofit advocate for Minnesota utility customers. Thank you for taking up this bill and for the opportunity to speak today. CUB and the Energy Sense Coalition have been working on the bill that's before you for more than a year to update the intervener compensation statute. The statute allows certain groups that participate in PUC dockets related to public utilities to have their costs reimbursed in certain cases. That's just public utilities, just the investor-owned utilities. It does not apply to cooperative or municipal utilities. Um, and the purpose, as Senator Friends says, is to get better public, um, better representation of the public interest at the PUC. The PUC is only allowed to consider evidence that's been put on the record in each docket before it. That means that commissioners depend on parties to bring evidence in each proceeding that's representative of the variety of considerations that they have to be taking into account. But it's very difficult to participate at the PUC and to bring the kind of depth of analysis that's needed. I come from a ratepayer pers perspective, and ratepayer interests are too rarely uh, well represented. This bill isn't going to overcome the resource imbalance that ratepayers face, of course, but it will help. Currently, the law allows public interest interveners to have their cost of participation reimbursed only in general rate cases up to $50,000 per case. And general rate cases are certainly very important, but they only happen periodically. 
For example, Excel is going through its first electric rate case in seven years right now, and its first natural gas rate case in more than a decade. And Minnesota Power is in the midst of its first full rate case in six years. It's not as though bills haven't gone up in that time, but it happens through other kinds of dockets. Utility charges can increase without rate cases, and this happens frequently. There are also dockets that deal with service standards, shutoffs, low-income assistance programs, and many other important issues. And none of those are covered by the current intervener compensation statute. While utilities recover the cost of representing themselves at the PUC from the ratepayers, there's no similar, rate, similar way for ratepayers to have their interests represented in these kinds of dockets. And that's why this bill is important. Senator Friends covered much of what the bill contains, so I'll just summarize very briefly what it does. Um, it allows compensation to be granted uh, to qualifying participants in proceedings regarding investor-owned electric and natural gas utilities. It limits the amount of compensation that be, can be granted to any group, and the total amount of, of compensation that any utility can be required to pay so that it represents a very nominal amount that's included in utility rates. And it raises the bar that parties have to reach in order to qualify, so compensation is only available to groups who provide work that's unique and that's reflected in the Commission's written order at the end of a proceeding. As Senator Friends said, the committee last year raised a number of questions and concerns, and we took those to heart and went back to the bill language to address, I think, every concern that was raised in the committee's hearing last year. Um, and I wanted just to list five ways that the bill has changed based on your feedback. First and foremost, as Senator Friends said, we added in the standard that nonprofits have to demonstrate financial hardship. So a large or well-funded organization can no longer qualify for compensation. And I think that was a good change and it's, it's making prudent use of, of ratepayer funds. Um, senators identified a loophole that could have allowed for double compensation in a docket that stretched over two calendar years. So that's been eliminated. Guidance for how the PUC should consider requests for compensation when they're approaching the cap has been added. A definition of proceeding has been added to the bill, and there's now a report back to the legislature after three years. Under the strict caps in the bill, even if compensation uh, is absolutely maxed out, which I, I think is unlikely, it can't add more than about four hundredths of one percent to, to any utilities collections. Helping ratepayer advocates to be in more dockets will save many times that. Um, I had been asked for examples in, in some of the conversations with members prior to this, so I thought it might be helpful to bring a few examples um, from Cub's work just over the past year. Um, one is that Cub is currently recommending that utilities be denied the ability to charge customers $158 million for money that was spent on natural gas during the price spike caused by the February 2021 winter storm. Cub argues that Excel, Centerpoint, and Minnesota, Re Minnesota Energy Resources could and should have um, done more to reduce costs, and they didn't because they thought they'd be able to pass all those costs through to their customers. This proceeding is currently before an administrative law judge and should be decided by the PUC this summer. Um, approximately $29 million was saved in another case for Minnesota Power customers last year. After the economy slumped in 2020 and large industry didn't buy as much electricity as projected, Minnesota Power turned to its ratepayers to make up for lost revenues. And Cub and others argued that it's not ratepayers' job to guarantee the company's revenues, and the request was denied. And one other example from a, a more recent case, Minnesota Power's residential interim rate increase was cut in half for this year. Interim rates are charged uh, on customers' bills while a general rate increase that a, util that a utility has requested is being considered. And last year, uh, the Energy Sense Coalition and CUB worked together with Minnesota Power to cut their residential interim rate uh, from 14 to 7%. So those are some examples from CUB's recent work, but of course, intervener compensation would be available to any groups that meets the strict standards in the bill. The bill is a result of a lot of hard work among ratepayer advocates, the utilities, the Department of Commerce, and legislators from both parties and both chambers. I, I thank Senator Frentz for carrying it and thank the committee for the opportunity to speak on it today and would be happy to address questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, uh, Ms. Leverson Falk. Uh, any questions uh, of the witness? If not, uh, we'll proceed to. Uh, Matthews. Matthews. I'm sorry, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for the explanation. Uh, I agree the bill is definitely much better than last year's, um, and, and you took many of the things to heart. Um, Ms. Levis and Falk, we discussed one-on-one -on -one earlier about who was kind of excluded and who was included with what you envisioned in this bill, and I wonder if you just wouldn't share that answer again 
for the the record here of, of where you think it will fall on on various groups included or not if this got enacted. Ms. Weber's at Falk. Sure, Mr. Chair and Senator Matthews. So some examples of the types of nonprofits that do intervene at the PUC, um, the larger ones that I, my understanding is they would not qualify under the standard would include like Sierra Club or um, Fresh Energy um, would not qualify and uh, smaller groups like the Citizens Utility Board and Energy Sense would. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't recall if I gave you any other examples earlier, but those are the ones that come to mind. Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Senator Matthews, yes. Thank you, and, and I believe that was correct as well. Um, what's the, so in just reading through this, what's the line um, 226 and 27 about uh, incorporated or organized within three years? Am I reading that to mean any organization that's less than three years old? Um, because uh, could you, could you, if, if you know, uh, if either of you would know, could you clarify that for me? Ms. Leverson Falk or? Yes, Mr. Chair, Senator uh, Matthews, that's correct, yeah. All right, thank you, Mr. Senator Chair. Matthews? Okay. Uh, let's move on then to uh, uh, Ms. Pam Marshall. Uh, I believe you're online virtually. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good okay, afternoon, Welcome members. to the committee and please proceed. Introduce yourself, please. Thank you, my name is Pam Marshall. Um, for the last 30 years, I have acted as the executive director of the Energy Sense Coalition. Our organization promotes affordable utility service for low and fixed income Minnesotans through participation in uh, public utility commission proceedings, policy advocacy, and also in the administration of direct utility bill payment and conservation assistance programs. The coalition supports this bill, not just because we can receive compensation for representing low-income consumers in response to utility company proposals, which we fully intend to continue doing. More importantly, though, we support this bill because some of the most time-consuming commission dockets involve stakeholder processes that work toward consensus positions on a range of issues. The reliance upon stakeholder processes has increased a lot since I began this work in 1992. I believe that shift represents a positive change. There is no longer always the assumption that there's an adversarial relationship between companies and advocates. The focus, though, on these more intensive conversations, while they do lead to a better understanding of parties' respective positions and, by extension, better poli policy outcomes, um, and, and in addition, more deliberate, I think, um, decisions by the Public Utilities Commission, they're time consuming um, and, and therefore they're expensive. And at the same time, there's still a bit of a David and Goliath dynamic when it comes to PUC proceedings, not just between the utility companies and public interest advocates, but also between smaller and larger larger public interest organizations. Larger organizations with more funding can simply participate in more proceedings. As a smaller low-income energy ad advocacy organization, if we invest time in some of the longer-term efforts, we're unable often to participate in other commission proceedings. If, however, we can earn compensation under the terms contemplated by this bill, we would not always have to limit our representation of low-income customers to the extent we do now. If some of our participation was compensated, we may be, for example, able to expand policy staff so a low-income consumer uh, perspective could be offered in more dockets. Importantly, because this bill does constrain by both organizational payroll and docket compensation, the extent of any potential staff expansion is still very modest. Passing this bill, in other words, may mean that our organization can afford to participate um, simultaneously and effectively in four to five uh, commission proceedings rather than two or three um, out of the 30 or more that may be in front of the commission at, at any given time. For example, because of our workload and limited resources, we had to choose to sit, stay out of the current Centerpoint energy rate case. 
even though our participation in previous center point cases resulted in lower rates for low use customers, or in another case, increased low income conservation investments. <coughs> Energy Sense also declined to participate in the natural gas price spike investigation that Ms. Levinson Falk referenced, um, even though before it was referred to an administrative law judge, we worked with parties to exclude energy assistance and certain past due customers from any sur surcharge associated with those price spikes. About $25 million of that surcharge uh, across the, nat the regulated natural gas utilities was not imposed on these customers who were already struggling to afford their natural gas bills. From our perspective, this is one of the most significant reasons to pass this bill. Energy Sense is often confronted with responding to multiple parties in any given proceeding. Our years of advocacy for equitable residential utility rates, as well as our experience designing and implementing low-income utility bill payment and conservation programs for thousands of energy burden customers, cannot always be offered in relevant documents, or dockets, excuse me. In that absence, important knowledge and perspectives perspectives based on that knowledge can get lost. It is our unique experience and the possible commission decisions based upon that experience that is acknowledged and potentially compensated in this bill. I will offer, offer a couple of examples of our work that could be compensated under the terms of this bill, but presently are not. Since March 2020, when the governor's COVID emergency declaration was made, Energy Sense worked with other consumer organizations and utility companies to track the economic impacts of the pandemic, including service disconnections, the number of customers in arrears, payment agreement terms, um, the number of customers receiving federal LIHEAP assistance, and annual indicators to gauge the effect of the pandemic on residential customers' ability to maintain essential energy service. Exact, exactly two years later today, we filed comments um, requesting the commission continue requiring regulated utilities to provide these comprehensive and ongoing reports. Consumer advocates develop uh, an inclusive reporting template supported by all the utilities um, and adopted by the commission that provides accessible, standardized, and transparent residential customer status information that can be used to inform policy decisions for the foreseeable future. These reports, for example, can signal the need to respond to worsening customer pass to utility bills or service disconnection trends and to target resources to mitigate those trends. None of this work was compensated, but would have been if this bill was passed. Energy Sense also participated in a multi-year stakeholder process to transition Minnesota Power's residential customer rates to a time of day rate structure and work to protect low-income ratepayers throughout that transition. This process took place outside of a rate case, but still re required a significant amount of time. Ultimately, the company and several organizations arrived at a consensus position to ensure that Minnesota Power's rates advance Minnesota's environmental and renewable energy goals while retaining affordability, affordable rates for lower usage and low-income customers an outcome that is usually difficult to achieve because the policy objectives of environmental goals and affordable rates often conflict. This work is relevant to Minnesota Power's rate increase request that is currently before the commission. Since the foundational work was done in that stakeholder process, potential settlement agreements can be reached in the pending rate case, shortening the time involved in that case and in doing so lowering the expenses charged to Minnesota Power's ratepayers. In asking you to support this bill, we are simply requesting that organizations like ours do not have to choose which PUC proceedings in which we will participate based primarily on financial considerations when nearly every PUC decision, directly or indirectly, affects low-income utility consumers. We think this bill takes an important step toward helping us continue to appear, participate, and influence the outcome of commission proceedings on behalf of low-income consumers. Thank you for considering this bill, Mr. Chair and members, and for the opportunity to testify today. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Marshall, for being with us today. Any questions uh, uh, amongst the members? 
Uh, Senator Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no questions at this time. Um, I just want to thank Ms. Levinson Falk uh, for all the work uh, that she did to address the concerns that we had last year. Um, I know it was a uh, had a lot of concerns and you were in my office a lot uh, working on those so I, I appreciate that and, uh, and the bill in its form now I, I'm uh, more than happy to support. Good, good. Anyone else? Uh, any, anybody from the audience uh, either virtually or here have any comments? If not, uh, Senate file 1621 as amended is uh, is set aside for possible inclusion. And uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Senator French, and to your witnesses. Uh, I think you had a good day. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, i just add this, is that we talk about checks and balances between legislative and executive. This is a bill that can help us maintain some good checks and balances between the utilities and the ratepayers. And I look forward to further discussions and thank all of you for the chance to present it today. Good, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, carrying these bills for us. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, members, anything else? Uh, if not, I'll just announce, uh, of course, we're meeting on Thursday. The general theme is going to be uh, carbon capture sequestration. Uh, Senator Benson has a bill that we'll hear as well. Uh, but it, uh, I'm told we have a couple of presentations on that technology. And, uh, so uh, unless there's anything else, uh, the meeting stands adjourned.